Please welcome to the stage Mara Hoffman and Omar Itani in conversation with Rajni Jacques. Hey. Good morning, all. How are you guys feeling? Awesome. Well, you are here today, and we are talking about sustainability when it comes to fashion. So, welcome to a wearable solution panel. Um, We're going to talk today with Mara and Omar just about how the fashion industry's carbon footprint and how how big that is, and just obviously with the climate change, what part of fashion plays into it. We want to talk about solutions and ideas to kind of help bring this all back. So obviously my name is Rajni, I am fashion director at Condé Nast, I'm also a creative lead, but we also have Mara Hoffman who is a designer, and she aims to create designs in a way that obviously sustainability is at the forefront. We also have Omar Itani, who is industrial engineer, UN Environmental Young Champions of Earth Winner 2019, and also the creator of Fabric Aid, and he'll get into what Fabric Aid is in the end. So I think we're just gonna start off with, fashion is one of those things where no one ever thinks, no one ever thinks about the point it plays when it comes to sustainability. And the thing is, fashion's footprint is even more than the airlines, which is sounds crazy, but in actuality it isn't. So can you guys kind of can you guys tell us a little bit about how fashion plays a part in what we're seeing today when it comes to the climate crisis? Mara? Sure. In a synopsis of it, a short one, uh, the fashion industry relies on non-renewable resources in order to manufacture the clothing. We are drastically overproducing, mass producing what we're doing, and the majority of these things that we are making are hardly being worn, if in some cases not being worn at all, and are literally being thrown out, millions of tons of clothing being thrown out. And this clothing is either burnt or ends up in landfills, where over time, It breaks down and emits methane, which ends up in our atmosphere, as well as the chemicals and the dyes that go into making these clothes, they build up and end up contaminating nearby groundwater and soils. So we are in a make and throw away kind of cycle right now that is creating a ton of pollution from the manufacturing processes to the amount of shipping we are doing from manufacturer to manufacturer, back to brand, to consumer, and as well as using synthetic fibers that are creating microplastics that we're all hearing about and knowing about now. So it's really, to me, we're out of whack as human beings right now, and we are creating a non-sustainable system based on our, our unsatiable hunger for more things. and. This is where I think the core of the issue is, is that humans have gotten out of whack with their desire for more and more and are trying to fill these voids, but the planet can't hold our our hunger right now. So the other thing that is happening is groups like this and people that are within the industry and outside of the industry that are coming together to take down the archaic systems that have been built and rebuild a new industry that is a future industry that can sustain for us and one that's built on circularity and responsibility and one that will hopefully see us into the new world. So that's also happening. Omar, do you have anything that you want to add into? The textile industry is the second most polluting industry in the world. To put this into perspective, in the UK alone, 1.7 1.7 billion items are not worn every year. Mm. In the UK, we have only 70 million people. This means that every person in the United States and in China combined have an item of clothing just from the UK. The amount of clothes are accelerating in an, insane, um, in an insane way. In the past 50 years, our consumption of textile have, decreased, have increased 63%. And we use every item half as much as we used to use it 15 years ago. And this consumption is continuing and growing and growing. In 2030, we expect to use 100 billion tons of clothes. 
the amounts are insane and they are still increasing. Although it's one of the industries where most of the pollution comes because of us. Yeah. Uh, out of every five people who recycle, one person is interested in a sustainable fashion. Although sustainable fashion produces much more solid waste than plastic. Uh, and it's, we need a mind shift. And people need to start looking at themselves and deciding how they can consume more ethical fashion, more sustainable fashion, and making sure that the fashion they consume is consumed for a longer period of time and is then recycled to and reused. And I think you bring up a good point because it, it, it is in the world of fashion, it's one of those things where it is such high consumption. And I do think it's a mindset that we kind of need to you know, curl back. I think with you, Mara, being an editor, you for me at least, I see a lot. And you were one of the first designers to really hold themselves accountable when it came to what were the wastes that you were producing, sustainable fashion. And I do think now upcycling, which is the new buzzword within the fashion industry, is something that whether it's buzzy or not, I do think more designers are kind of like looking in that way. But again, going back to you, you were one of the first people to do it. Um, to hold your brand accountable, even if it hurt your company in the margins, you did take a step where it was like, okay, let me reset my company. Let me take a step back, let me analyze what I'm putting out there, and let me reset. So what were some of the small things that you were able to do to accomplish that? And then what were some of the, the big things that you were just like, I don't know if I can do that in a very sustainable way. So what were the smaller and the bigger things that you were able to do? First, let me just state that we, we are not pioneers um, as a brand in making this move movement. There are other brands and movements that have come before us that have really led the way. And we absolutely could not have done any of the work that we have been doing without those people before us who have been our mentors, who have been our guide, who have become our community in this movement for reaching up to and asking for help, asking for resources. And one of the most amazing things from my perspective about this shift has been that sense of community. My experience through fashion before that was a very um, proprietary based working relationship with people where it wasn't about sharing resources. And when we came into this, journey, we had to reach up for help from the people who had done this before. And then in turn now we're able to share that same information or the information that we've learned through our own experience with those that are trying to come up and make the moves themselves. So it is a very community-based movement, which was, is an amazing part of this. As far as the moves we made and the challenges, one of the biggest challenges for us was we made this shift when the company was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. We had been on this trajectory towards this growth and this manufacturing plan and to fill the hunger, kind of mindlessly almost just continue to show up in this. And there was definitely a wall that I hit on a consciousness level and wanting to participate in what we were doing in a very different way that we didn't know how to do at that point. And this was five years ago. And just to sort of set the scene, so much has shifted in five years. It is a different world within the sustainable fashion world. Um, but for us at the time, it was really about resources and how do we make this shift and have enough to offer? What are the materials we can be using? We spent a ton of time researching and auditing our own company to understand all of our processes and who we were working with, who were our partners in manufacturing and the mills we were working with, what were the fibers we were actually using, how about our dyes, how about our printing processes, down to the trims. And this became just a sobering examination of what we were doing. And from that point, our first moves were shifting out conventional fabrics for recycled fabrics. And it started on a fiber level and on a dye level. And then within each season, we were able to set new goals for ourselves as a brand. But with that comes, again, challenges around finance. Yeah. In order to make a move like this, as in anything, once you're upgrading to anything better, especially a less impactful, less harmful fabric or process or manufacturing partner, you're paying for that. And being an independent company since the beginning, this was something that I don't think we clearly 
had set out for ourselves. We didn't have a business plan set up understanding the contraction that we would be making in order to do this. But the plus side of this is that we were an independent company, so we were able to make very risky moves and ones that wouldn't have been approved if we had some huge partner or finance um, person looking at this. So we were able to be sort of super risky with it. Yeah. Uh, and then we're still in challenges around this. I mean, I think that this is a perpetually challenging thing to do. Fashion and sustainability are, they're a conundrum. It's, you don't ever really become a sustainable fashion company unless you either shut down or are completely reliant on upcycling and circularity with your waste. So for a company like myself, who is still manufacturing new, we're always in this process of finding better ways, less harmful ways. Um, and for example, balancing out, you want longevity in a piece of clothing that you're making. That's a very important part of sustainability is longevity. Explaining to your customers to buy something, spend more money on that, and wear it for much longer. Let it be your uniform. But in order to do that, it's about deciding, are you comfortable with putting spandex into that piece so that it lasts longer, even though the spandex does not have an end of life cycle to it. So it's making these kind of compromises and decisions as you go along, but really right now I don't see, um, as long as we're still in this business, that kind of challenge and discomfort is part of the motivator of what's getting us to each next step of this process. Exactly. And for you, Omar, you know, tell us your personal journey when it came to Fabricade and what Fabricade is about. And you know, I know that you are impacting lives and creating a healthier planet, so I just want to know your journey to, to getting to that place. Sure. When you introduced me, you mentioned that I'm an industrial engineer, and this is not fully true. Uh, before graduating, I dropped out of university to join an accelerator that helps uh, people with ideas to create social enterprises. Uh, and I joined this accelerator once I realized that there is no full efficient system that collects clothes from the rich and distributes it to the underprivileged communities in an effective and carbon uh, uh, conservative manner. Uh, what Fabricate does, we collect second-hand clothes from uh, schools, universities, businesses, big brands. We work with uh, Nike and Life Lauren and many other brands. We take the clothes, we sort it, we clean it, and we sell it at extremely affordable prices to marginalized communities. The prices range between 0 0.3 and maximum $2 per item. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing about what we do is the way we distribute the clothes. We go to extremely underprivileged areas in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria. We cater to refugees and to marginalized communities. And in those stores, uh, the clothes is set up in a very nice way. Everything is hanged, neatly displayed with price tags, biodegradable shopping bags, fitting rooms, personalized advice. People come in, they choose whatever they want at prices that they can afford mm -hmm. without feeling that somebody is doing charity for them. And this is the feeling of power because fashion, the idea of choosing what you want to wear is power by itself. And not only giving people the, the, the ability to choose whatever they want to wear, but also the ability to have a dignified shopping experience identical to the ones more people in more privileged societies have. Uh, items that cannot, be uh, that cannot be reused because they are stained, they are in a bad situation, are upcycled and recycled into new clothing items. We started two years ago from three, people, three university students and now we are more than 100 uh, employees working at the initiative uh, between project base and full-timers. Uh, we, we collect, I think, more than 20 tons of clothes on a monthly basis. And all of it, we have zero fabric waste, so all of it is either resold or sent to be recycled or upcycled. Wow. Right. <laughs> Back to Mara, I know you, for me, are an activist at the core. Yes, you are a fashion designer, but I do think that, you know, it may sound hokey, but there's a spiritual side to this for you. Um, and it's not so, okay. <laughs> um, but do you think you know, it's about personal drive is necessary in order for a brand leader to change his or her approach to how they create or distribute their project, their product? Absolutely, I can I can really only speak for myself in this that if I didn't have the conviction or the immense amounts of discomfort, mm -hmm. I could not be doing this and be 
trying to create other levels of change. I always credit discomfort as such an important part of anybody's mission because you feel this out of alignment feeling and it gives you the impetus to work towards alignment. As far as the spirituality part is, this entire thing that we're going through is a spiritual moment for all of us, whether we recognize that or not. Humans are going through something really major and the planet is reflecting it back to us. We are in a state of discomfort and there's no way for the planet to reflect anything but that back to us right now. But the hopeful side of that is if we take that individual time to recollect re-establish new relationships with material things across the board, new relationships with everything that we acquire, recheck our belief systems in what it means to feel whole, what it means to feel seen. Mm -hmm. I think that on that individual level, we'll be able to collect a, we will be able to get a collective that can sustain. But if we try and form these collective movements and the individuals not taking their part of self-examination and how we are playing a part for ourselves in relationship to it, this collective movement can't go forward. So conviction and feeling discomfort and choosing to show up. And for anybody that is in this movement, anybody that is in trying towards sustainability in fashion, you are feeling uncomfortable right now. And if you are not feeling uncomfortable right now, I'm not sure that you're really in the same movement, but it's part of it and it's an exciting part of it to do you shift think, it. Do you think the fashion industry is doing enough? No, of course not. We're still in a really tragic space with it and it's still really run on, on greed and overconsumption, absolutely, and playing on people's insecurities and their discomfort, especially women, 100%. I think that it needs to be looked at and completely rebuilt. I don't know if it will be completely be rebuilt right now, but it's not doing enough that it can. And for you, Omar, um, what would you say to other young sustainability entrepreneurs, especially ones from small countries like Lebanon, like yourself? Uh, there is a power in being, of course, when you are in a small country, the market is much smaller, but there is a huge power in being in a small economy and a small market. Mm -hmm. Lebanon has a population of 4 million, so the power is in small circles. It's much easier for me to reach the president of Lebanon, the minister of public health or the minister of social affairs mm -hmm. in Lebanon than to reach it at a country that has more than 300 million, uh, like the United States. Uh, capitalizing and utilizing those small circuits, making sure that everybody is engaged in your, in your initiative, whether it was the end consumer, whether it was the beneficiary or the leg legislator, it's much easier to establish that and create a brand name in a smaller economy, mm -hmm. and that's power. Yeah. And just to round this out, you know, what, and this is to both of you, what do you want to take sust sustainability brands from here? And do you see the fashion industry and I know, Mara, you said it's not doing enough, but are there things that they are doing right um, to help kind of push this agenda forward? I think that people are feeling the pressure right now, whether it comes from a true space of wanting to shift or just having the pressure from their consumers on them right now, whatever it is, if, as long as it's creating a change for them, yes, and making commitments. These larger companies are making commitments. If they're soon enough, I don't know, but I think that just the awareness is a beginning. It really needs to speed up. And as far as the biggest thing that I think we need to look at, and at least from my company that we're working towards, is again, comes back to circularity, full ownership for the pieces that we're putting out there. It's really great and, I mean, I don't even know if it's really great, but it's, it's a step in the right direction to be making things from less impact fibers and to take this first end of it, very do the best that you can. But if you're releasing these things into the world with no end plan for them, then what's the point? So for us and for the fashion industry, it's really about circularity, taking it back, having an end of life plan for what we're making. Great. And I want to say thank you, Omar, thank you. and thank you, Mara, for this.